Welcome back to the Purple Worm, a group RPG podcast on Anchor where four British guys are talking about RPGs. And in this episode, we're continuing our discussion from previous about prophecies and ways in which game systems can be used to give players a little bit more narrative control in RPGs. The way I started doing it was um, this. So when I was playing Fate games, is there's a lot of sort of stunts that give you like things like oh, um, if you spend a Fate point, you have a contact in the area that you're in, and. Obviously, not knowing when that was going to be triggered, I was like, "Well, I'm not going to like plan out like a vast flotilla of contacts just on the off chance." So when the player you say, "All right, um, yeah, we're we're running a sci-fi game, we're in like this Moss Eisley style cantina, I'm throwing a fate point down. I've got I've got a criminal contact here," and I'll be like, "I've got nothing planned for that. I just be like, I, I, I was forced almost to go right. Well, what's your contact like? Tell me a bit about him." Just because then I was like, well, if I come up with something just off the top of my head, I've got to come up, I've got to somehow like mentally intuit mm. a, a contact that's going to get on with this player character, whereas and one they're going to be interested in. Whereas if they tell me it, I know they must at least have some interest in that contact because they're giving me the information. And obviously, as a GM, you can play like any NPC. So yeah. w- whatever they say, oh yeah, the, uh, I know this spice smuggler who is in this place. I, I, I can play that. That's quite easy. But um, as I've sort of gone along with that, I found it one of the the more sort of genuinely interesting things for me as a GM because it means that the game doesn't just follow that sort of linear progression from A to B, so it keeps it interesting for me. Right, it's fun for you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's 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 the and, biggest and, reason why I endorse it now. Yeah. And, and if the players come up with an idea and, and you take and run with it, they get something back from it as well, don't they? Because they feel they're actually adding to the story that's as opposed it. to playing in the, in the GM story. Yeah, and um, just to let you know, guys, we've got uh, Jason Connolly in the Twitch chat. Hello, Hi, Jason. Hi, Jason. And he, yeah, he's... he can witness us putting a really nice pin in that. Yeah. That, that's it. <laughs> and, 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 put a and, not pin in it, <laughs> and not putting a pin in it at all and just, just carrying on. And uh, <laughs> J- Jason was saying, um, as a DM, if you have a certain set of things you, you want to be the truth, you can just like not ask players about those things, and obviously, yeah, you can you can sort of if even if you're saying to a player like, oh, tell tell me a bit about this contact. If I just say to you, oh, okay, you go, oh, I've got a criminal contact in this place, and I go, right, tell me about the criminal contact. You can say anything you want that's like a criminal. Whereas if I say, oh, t- t- tell me about that ex-imperial agent who's a contact of yours, yeah. I've shaped that a little bit, but you've still got a lot yeah. of. A yeah. lot of room to manoeuvre as a player character within that description, but likewise, if I, if I don't want you having like, if I know you're like a a person who's into like they're sort of like they're non-human player characters and then they're non-human NPCs, but you're in like a humanocentric sort of town, I, I can easily sort of slant it in a way to sort of give you like a a restricted set of options, if you will. But still give you plenty of room to maneuver and be creative within yeah, those cause, restrictions. Because sometimes, if you if you don't give them some boundaries, it can go off in a horrible tangent to you, and you can get really caught out, can't you? I Especially, think that's I think that's the perceived risk, isn't it? You, maybe I've been lucky, but that's the fear, isn't it? That's the fear. You 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 give people the, the freedom, and you and you imagine that it's all going to come crumbling down around your ears. I, it, I've it, never it, I've never found it to be the case, but. I think it helps as well if you if you've got a, a regular set of players, then you yeah. get you get to know what yeah, of course uh, you do. the yeah. sort of things they're going to come out with. And the thing is, players you... will do that anyway. They they'll yeah. do it because they'll pick up on some random tick that you've given an NPC by mistake, and that will then become the NPC's name. <laughs> it will yeah. become yeah. Mm-hmm. the way mm-hmm. that they relate to that NPC, whether you intended them to or not. Do you know what I mean? They go, let's yeah. go and see old. Well, What's that's I mean, you know, Oh, yeah, they just get you give them you know, a good just, name. Yeah. You just give them a good name, and they f- like they fall in love with the character and yeah. want to go and see him yeah. all the time just because you did him. Amu- he was amusing. Well, that's yeah. it. I mean, I, I often use the example of uh, when I ran a, a Numenera game years ago now, and you get like a, a random background role, which just gives you some random bit of flavor for your background. And um, one of the player characters, like Matthew, he um, he rolled that his uncle owned a theater in the town, and I was like, all right, so. 
I, I, I roll on a few random tables, and I was like, oh, this guy's like wearing like these these horrendous sort of like day glow sort of like yellow sort of zoot suits almost and he um, he's redecorating this theater in all like gaudy shades and i played him as like a cross between like got Kwan and like daddy john jules at a red dwarf mm-hmm. and and literally like, every session after that when they were like when they, they hadn't got anything immediate going on they were like should we go and see what your uncle's up to with that theater whether he's finished his like renovation <laughs> yeah yeah i i had a merchant called chenny do chenny do ekim and um he was like this looky, what we used to call like a looky, looky man, which was a guy like when we went to um, Mallorca, there was guys selling stuff on the beaches and stuff. And um, I just did this sort of like bad sort of African kind of accent because I thought these characters were great on the beaches, man, where they're like doing the melon and the pineapple and stuff and coming around selling. And I just did this guy and everybody loved him because – I'd managed to just about kind of get my version of the accent going and uh, they loved him. And, and it was a bit different to the old sort of cheerful barman or the standard slippery merchant. He was just a colorful character. You're, and they loved it. You're playing like you're playing through like the jungle sort of campaign in fifth edition at the minute. Aren't you, yeah. 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 For well, sure. when I played it, when um, Andre Martinez was running it, when I was still playing loads of games like um, people in America, and he had he had this guy who was like a, a guide to like Port Port Nyanzaru, uh-huh. and, and he had this like really deep sort of like slow sort of little thing voice. He'd be like, "Ah, welcome to Port Nyanzaru. <laughs> its streets are paved with peril." And he and he, he was just like a really overblown sort of like dungeon yeah. master, like yeah, this yeah. NPC speaking to you. And literally like, every time we were like in Port Nyanzaru, and there was like nothing in particular going on, but like. Wonder where that guide is. He'd be like, oh, "Oh, which guide? Do you mean you, you, you know the one, the one with the yeah. voice." Uh, We're like, yeah, "Oh, yeah, go and yeah, see him, yeah. find out what's going on." And he's like, "Ah, oh, my friends, it's good to see the barrels of Port Nyanzaru have not claimed you." I, I think it's a brilliant location because there's so much uh, potential for stuff like that, and you can do, you can have all these kind of like, you can get some of that um, Moroccan stuff going on, or like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, or uh, something like. Um, uh, James Bond and that. There's that guy who always plays the characters with a fez and that. Oh, and yeah. it's, it's it's that weird kind of clash of cultures thing going on. Well, I think I think as well. I mean, to to sort of like drag us like kicking and screaming back to the topic. Um, what what we I gave what, up on that. I tried. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's, fine. Women, it's fine. It's fine. But what 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 we're saying though is we're, we're, we're still <laughs> we're still technically on topic because what we're talking about yeah. effectively is like building up your own sort of legends and your own sort of little myths and little tales uh, within a game setting so, well, we're, yeah see we're talking we're talking about like our favorite npcs and like you know all these contacts and you find out all these stories of little bits that happen in the game you and get your own folklore that, that's it yeah exactly and you talk about it with the other player characters and it almost because it almost like with most like urban legends as they get passed from yeah. person to person they have to be like grow out of all proportion and they get a bit yeah. distorted and by the time you've like you've finished like telling a few people about it that like mpc or like picked your pocket in the marketplace it wasn't just some like spotty herbert who like no, he's a legend. yeah he, he was some like master thief with like a gang of thugs who like that there's no way he could have possibly like picked my pocket. He must have been oh, I must have been at least like a tenth level thief. He just like melted out of the shadows and like grabbed my mm-hmm. coin purse, and he was gone. Oh, the the guards were obviously on the take, so they didn't want to do anything about it. So, and I know a lot of people have said in various different podcasts recently, people have talked about how the the story is what happens in the game, and it's like the fact that you talk about it with the players and the tales sort of grow in the telling. And I think that's that's what we're talking about with a lot of these sort of urban legends and these myths because they change as time goes on, and it's people telling them and they sort of they they slant it based on their own viewpoint. And we see this a lot in games. I mean, if you say if you get four different players and you say to them, "All right, tell me what happened in the last session of your game," you'll probably get a slightly different story mm. from each of them. Oh yeah, it's the Chinese mm. whispers type yeah. of idea, isn't it? And, and and I think the thing, the thing about this 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 Sheppy tale that I was talking about, it's only a really like small little part of this book. There's there's two, like I said, there was two versions, and the first version of it where you got the gist of the story was only a kind of large paragraph, but it do, it it doesn't take a lot. You you don't need pages and pages of stuff just to get that 
get the ball rolling because um, I've talked about it before, but the reason I picked Sheppy was I quite like that. Firstly, I like that maritime theme. So, you know, if you was putting together an adventure and you thought, you know, I'm, I'm getting a book on the fabled coast. I, I got this specifically because perhaps I knew I was doing something and I wanted it to be coastal. So I just get something that's going to have all coastal stuff. And then I knew there's like, there's a, a, a rich tradition of uh, maritime history down there because it's on the Thames estuary. It was a, 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 a Royal Naval dock up until 1960. So I thought, all right, so there's a good maritime history. It was set up by, it turns out, it was set up as a, um, a naval dockyard because Henry VIII was wanting to, to protect the, um, oh, What's, what's the name of the river there that goes up past Romford? Um, not Romford. I'm a northerner. I have no idea. No. Oh. Yeah, no I the Medway. The Medway. So oh. he wanted to protect the Medway. And uh, Henry VIII was jumpy about France. Because basically, you could you could just more or less sail up to London. So you needed stuff. Um, and Samuel Pepys come up with this dockyard at Sheppey. I thought, oh, yeah, that that's pretty cool. That ties in this... this there's stuff you could do if you was running a kind of, you know, that sort of like a Lamentations game. You you got all maps. There's 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 loads of stuff you can right. Or if you if you're doing Midlands or Great London, you yeah. just suck all of that stuff you in, s- didn't you? Yeah. Suck all of that stuff straight up. The the fear of the magic and the sorcery that that's there in the story. You know, just because somebody throws that in there, he he's fearful and he cuts the head off of his loyal horse. You know that that's quite a that's quite a good kind of sword and sorcery type of trope where you've got barbarians that are fearful of magic and stuff. I, in I think it, I think it's interesting as well because uh, obviously knights, certainly in some of the tales about them, they tend to be bound by like certain strictures, certain codes of behaviour, if you want to call them that. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's sort of reflected in this tale. So, you know, this knight's like, oh, he, he doesn't like his reputation solid or whatever by these accusation mm-hmm. of sorcery. So mm-hmm. he, he chops the head off away. his trusty horse without even, like, blinking. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, because it's like, I'm not having that. I can't have any accusations like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, and we, we, oft, we often see some sort of knights or sort of, like, knightly-style characters, like characters with the trappings of knighthood, in RPGs, obviously in your fantasy RPGs. But I do wonder how often you see those sort of like codes of behavior and those sort of strictures represented in RPGs? Actually, that's a, that's a fun thing. I mean, you've got your, if you're playing fifth ed and you're not playing from basic, so you're playing with your paladin with mm-hmm. a mount. Do paladins get mounts in fifth ed? I think they uh, do. Yeah. yeah. So, so there, there's a nice little plot hook for you, isn't there? A paladin's mount being accused of mm. sorcery or wickedness. So obviously your player character is not going to take that option. Because it's their bloody mount, you know, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. part of their character. But you could, but you could see that working. The refusal to do it could get them into all kinds of trouble. For sure. Well, so well yeah, nice I mean, thread there. again, you, it's mentioned a lot with like clerics and people like that. Who, mm. let's face it, there's there's barely a religion in the real world that doesn't have certain strictures and codes of behaviour associated with that religion, whatever they may be. Um, but again, how often do you see that sort of brought to the fore? In a role pen, I remember probably about an old Dragon magazines reading it, where the, the the sort of hypothetical situation that was being discussed is: let's say you're playing like a lawful good cleric of some god of light and healing, and one of your party members is like a a, a lawful evil rogue of a backstabbery, mm. and he, he gets knocked down in a combat while he's trying to shank a city guard and like steal his purse, and immediately the cleric's over and like, oh, I use my I use my powers to heal him. And the couple of the questions that were asked in the article is like, one, if your power's coming directly from your god, why is your god giving you power to like yeah. heal someone who's opposed to what they stand for? Yeah. And if yeah. the power's just sort of put into the cleric when they pray at the start of the day or whatever, when you've done that, and like your god's getting ready to send you like the next package of divine power, so to speak, mm. sh- surely they're going to be like, oh, I can't have noticed you've been like healing a lot of evildoers with this power I've been sending to you. But again, that those those sort of codes, which are sort of purely really a sort of role play thing, they don't seem yeah. to be represented that often. Yeah, I mean, I I quite like to try and 
give myself limitations. And a classic one of mine is when I play a warrior, I quite like to say I'll turn my nose up at ranged weapons, you know, because that was a thing. Um, mm. you, you don't be shooting. You don't be shooting people from afar. You've got to, like, meet them eye to eye and take them out in proper hand-to-hand combat. And, you know archers and that firing from afar that was a bit of a scummy kind of low life thing to do so if if you're playing some sort of noble you 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 know knights nah knights didn't engage in bow fire that was not shiv- that was not chivalrous i think that was even in um i think that was in war in warhammer in the ta- in the uh the fantasy battle game um the the bretonians or something like that were it was only the peasants that used yeah, bows was, yeah. and stuff. Mm. Mm. And siege engines and knights didn't like all that. Yeah, because it was like you had your units of knights who obviously had like their lances and their, their hand mm-hmm. weapons and their, their plate armour and stuff like that. And like you say, all of the missile stuff was like peasant levies and stuff like that. Yeah, it was dishonourable business, all that. Yeah. But but again, it's, it's one of those things where... It'd be dishonourable for a knight to do it because they've got these codes and streets of behaviour. Yeah, but they turn but, a blind eye on there. Yeah, yeah, but the, the the commoners, well, not not even turning a blind eye to it. The commoners aren't held to the same sort no, of no, of course not. The no, same no. strictures, of, the same sort of limits on their behaviour. So that, in a way, that actually like frees them up to perform other useful functions that the knights can't do themselves. In this case, mm-hmm. missile weapons. Mm. So that's the end of another episode of Purple Worm. We hope you've enjoyed our musings on chivalry, codes of behaviour, and ways to give players a little bit more narrative control in RPGs. If you had, if you disagreed with us, if you agreed with us, or if you just want to talk about something else, you can drop us a voicemail on the Anchor app, or you can get in touch with us at purplewormpodcast at gmail.com and drop us an email. Thank you very much for the call-ins. We really do enjoy listening to those. So next time, Dave Aldridge is going to be talking about a legend and a myth that has a particularly personal meaning for him. So until we see you next time, take care, have fun, and watch out for those purple worms. See you soon. Thank you.